if, if you're happy to stay with us, that would be sure. that would be absolutely brilliant. What I'm going to invite um, is actually all of our other speakers who are still with us on the line to, if they want to take part in the final panel session, to please turn on their cameras so that I know that you want us to come to you. Um, to keep your cameras off if you prefer us not to come to you. I promise not to ask you the nine-year-old versus deep sea mining question because that would be truly cruel with regards to all of that. However, what I will do is I'm going to come to the man with a map behind him at the moment. Yes, Matt, it's your turn. So Matt's been sitting with us um, this afternoon, either listening on Zoom or on YouTube as well. Um, Matt, what are some of your reflections from what you've heard this afternoon or just your general reflections on what we're hearing in the conference as a whole? Okay, yes, thanks. Um, uh, this afternoon's talks, I thought, I thought being, yeah, as usual, excellent lineup. And I really enjoyed um, Paul's talk at the end, you know, this massive dollop of realism that we kind of all needed. I think I just scribbled down a few words. We need to get real, get on with it. And, and this is one of the things that I kind of keep coming back to is like, we know that we know the solutions. A lot of us in these calls, this conference are very technically capable. We know the solutions, we know what to do. So let's, let's just get on with it. Uh, in the words of uh, Monty Python and Holy Grail. Um, but the kind of the, the two main themes I want to come back to and Maybe we can revisit the second one uh, at a later point. But the first one is is this kind of world of finance that, you know, I'm an exploration geologist, so I'm used to being very much the person who is out there doing the stuff uh, on the ground in the first place. And a lot of the projects that I tend to see are these the more junior ones. So this, what what was it called? Stakeholder capitalists. So it's this short term and short term view of projects. You know, you're trying to make money. Uh, a lot of them are gold projects because that's where they can make the, the quickest kind of cash. Um, and what I see is this big elephant in the room in this whole kind of the whole mining industry is that I think uh, Ben Lepley mentioned it this morning. Uh, one of my, my ex colleagues, you know, he, him and I share this opinion very, very, <laughs> yeah, very passionately. And it's that kind of idea that, OK, now we're going to switch to become a green metal battery metals industry. And it's this kind of both sides of the coin is there's a huge amount of opportunity here for us to make lots of money. So carry on doing what we've done. And on the other side of it, we're doing it because it's the right thing to do. It's a good thing for society and for us. And when you have a business where you're kind of switching from that, oh, yeah, we're just, we're now going to start doing battery metals, but we've still got a bit of this stuff on, on the side of it. So the example is, you know, with, with coal mining, I think you said previously when you went to the COP26, you're like, everyone thinks mining is coal. And you go, oh, hang on, we don't do that. We do battery metals. We do this stuff for the energy transition. We also do a bit of gold, a bit of diamonds, but you know we don't want to talk about that. It's very confusing what we're actually doing. As you've seen in all, the hydrocarbons industry, uh, companies changing their names to be energy companies. So maybe that's something, uh, the bit change in business model, Paul. I'm really intrigued to see what comes out of your findings, of your uh, the kind of your studies. But um, maybe there's a whole new way that we need to kind of take out those kind of sectors and, and kind of rebrand ourselves and i worry that current business models in organizations kind of still stay on that kind of track of just changing change the way they do things by putting money into renewables or esg and i just feel it's a bit like paying the rspca so you can keep picking your dog i just don't really know how it's how it's going to work um so i'll leave you with those kind of thoughts uh thank you to everyone i do have another another kind of thing i want to cover which is more broader for the whole all of this um conference but i'll let another speaker go so thanks Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Matt. Um, Paul, your your name obviously was mentioned just that just then, just before Matt went and said, "Is it like paying paying a charity um, for animal we welfare whilst still kicking your dog?" Um, do, do you have any comments to what Matt said? Well, I mean, I mean, I think he was he was talking about a prospective new business model. I, I, I mean, the fact of the matter is, the businesses have to make money, but if they regard making money as the only thing that matters. And we must remember that that has a long uh, economics tradition for that. And for specifically what Milton Friedman said was that the only business of business is making money for their shareholders. Um, that was posited on the assumption that government was strong enough to look after the morals and social welfare of the nation, because even Milton Friedman didn't believe that markets did everything for everybody. Um, and governments are unable to do that if business effectively takes over government. 
And increasingly, we're in a situation where that is the case, where businesses are so influential, both through their donations to politicians and through the number of people that they employ, that effectively they can uh, skew the rules so that governments can't look after the social welfare. And the governments, therefore, can't create the conditions for business of different business models. And uh, that is a real problem. And as I say, we got into the politics of this for a bit with the European Union. The European Union is trying to change that equation by um, making it possible for businesses to do the right thing and still make money, perhaps make less money than they would otherwise make, but still make enough money to keep in business, which is obviously important. Um, but that's still very much in its infancy. And um, I mean, I think there was something um, in the old social license to operate that was a bit like Matt said. Um, I wouldn't have put it quite like paying money so that you can keep kicking the dog, but um, I would say giving the dog a sedative so that it didn't bite you in the leg. Um, uh, it would be more that kind of analogy. Um, a few hops to the local communities um, so that they didn't protest too much when they were screwed by the mines coming along uh, into, their, in, 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 into their localities. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, it is, I'm, I read this in the academic literature now all the time, that we need system transformation, system transformation. And that means transformation in the public and private sectors, but it also means cultural transformation. It also means transformation in our minds such that we start valuing things like the environment and social welfare and uh, human rights and gender equality and all the other things that are in the SDGs, we start valuing them as much as making a quick buck. And at the moment, that's not the case. Yeah, thanks for that, Paul. I should just state very clearly that we categorically do not approve of animal cruelty in any shape or form. And this is just an analogy that we're using here at this point in time, just before we all get cancelled or something like that. Um, Norm, I know that you wanted to come in on this and comment, and then perhaps I'll go back to Matt for his, his second comment. <laughs> sure. Thanks very much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. I, I wanted to mention two phrases. This has been a great session. Thanks so much. Um, and I, I just want to mention a couple of phrases. And I just heard the social license mentioned by Paul, uh, the social license to operate. And also wanted to mention the stakeholder, uh, sorry, the show, shareholder activism trends that we have now globally with multinational companies. And uh, I've done some work with multinationals that are doing mining in both uh, North and South America and Europe. Um, and, and they don't all uh, have the desire to do everything at absolute minimum cost, but they certainly are trying to minimize cost. That, that's absolute. But what I've found in my experience working mainly in Latin America over the last 15 years is that uh, the, the multinationals who have some good principles driving them, uh, along with making the money for the shareholders, uh, will apply those principles wherever they operate. This has been my experience. And they will listen to what's needed to achieve their social license. And frankly, if they don't have it, they will not develop. They will not develop. They will be stopped. Now, they may be stopped in a, in a, in a violent way, uh, involving protests and even deaths, which has happened in Peru, unfortunately. Or they may be stopped in other ways, like by not obtaining their permits or having permits revoked or having conditions on permits. But they, they will do what's needed. And I've worked on projects where the companies have voluntarily added benefits to communities that are long-lasting. Um, and I mean long-lasting beyond the life of the operating mine. And so I believe that's an example we can work with and talk about. Uh, and that really has to do with social license as well as with shareholder activism, because the shareholders of those companies are aware that that's needed around the world. So I'm not saying it's an easy out, <laughs> but it's definitely a private sector route. It doesn't involve the government. Uh, it, it, I, I believe system change, like you said, Paul, may be needed. I think that's an, that might be geologic time to me. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe we'll be forced into some change. We have no choice. But in the meanwhile, we have private companies that are doing the right thing. There's some good examples. And I'm not here to promote any of them. I'm just saying that I've had that experience with some multinationals and, and others here have. 
And I like to talk about, I like to just mention those, those factors here as part of the discussion. Thanks very much for the chance to comment. Great, thank you very much, Norm. Um, Matt, let's come back to you. I know you had a second point that you wanted to raise. Yeah, so uh, this kind of picks on um, the whole kind of session and probably the last couple of years of these kind of responsible raw material kind of seminars and kind of some of the takeaways that I've I've kind of gained from it. And I'm a big fan of this, uh, the kind of generalist versus the specialist. I think the generalists are much more needed in, in society. And um, a lot of, I think this afternoon, people have mentioned, you know, working in silos. We've got lots of people brought together from different perspectives, different areas. Um, and everyone keeps talking about how complex these challenges are. And I think there's a, there's a great quote from Isaac Asimov, and he says, the saddest aspect of life right now is that science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. And it's that kind of idea that, you know, the world we live in at the moment is in, increasingly complicated. We're dealing with more wicked problems than we we're dealing with before. So what we do today is going to be different to tomorrow and it'll be different to next week. And so it's exactly what Paul said, we need to flip everything upside down and start from scratch, really, because the current way we do things isn't working. And I think we're a bit living in a dream world for it to be suitable for the future. So I think to address the kind of complexity, we as professionals need to allocate uh, more responsibility to the kind of our silos um, and our distinct specialisms and kind of look from things from a much more holistic approach. So using those people who are good at connecting people, I'd probably put yourself in that category, Sarah, you kind of pull together these kind of dis discussions, which are really good. I think the next step is to kind of get into that action. How do we get to that action? So how do we get to that tipping point where all of these points and things we're discussing, we know we need to do, we know how to do it, but how do we get over that lip so it happens? And I really hope it isn't too late. Uh, I don't think it is. Uh, I might sound a bit too cynical, but I do have some hope. So I'd be interested to see what anyone else's kind of comments are on that and how do we get to that kind of tipping point? Yes. I, I mean, a question I'd love to ask Norman is, um, uh, given that there are good actors in the um, mining uh, companies who will do the things that you said, how can one generalize that behavior or make it more common uh, is that something that is going to happen through bodies like ICMM, or is it something that requires government action uh, in in order to to generalise it? Because at the moment, um, you know much more about this than I do, but I would have said it's more the exception than the rule. Yeah, uh, well, that's a good question. Of course, I can't speak to the to how broad it is. I know that sustainability reporting from the major miners has been for a long time just kind of greenwashing, you know, and so that's now becoming much more focused as to how they really report to their shareholders and to their stakeholders. Uh, how would it be generalized? I think the ICMM is very valuable, uh, but it speaks to the mining community, not to the general public. Uh, I, I guess and that was part of my discussion with the main lithium communicators was, how do we actually speak to the public about this and say that mining can be done in a sustainable way? Uh, I don't understand. I'm not clear on whether governments can influence this. I do believe it's very much a private sector initiative, and I believe certain large companies, I can't speak to the midsize. I think the large companies that are out there know that this may actually give them a competitive advantage in terms of their shareholder value. And so we were still talking about money, <laughs> but we're talking about value to the shareholder. And the shareholder says, I'm going to invest in this company because I know that they are doing the right thing, and they've showed me that. So I, it really does have so much to do with communicating what they do and whether it has lasting value in the community. We, we tried in, in some work we did here in Peru, we, <laughs> uh, to talk about sustainable communities, of course, rather than sustainable mining. Sustainable mining, those words don't even fit together uh, unless we talk about the 100% recycle and we still need raw materials no matter what. So well, how, why don't we talk about sustainable communities that are involved with mining? And we may want to try that example in the state of Maine, for example, with, with Peter, and say, how do we talk about that in our state where mining has created impacts that are known? And it, groundwater contamination in fractured bedrock is one of the toughest things to clean up that I know of. Very, very expensive. And mining has created that in Maine. So that had a lot to do with the history of, of the regulations that are basically blocking open pit mining. So how do we communicate that there are other ways to do this? I, I think there's opportunity. 
I, I like it. I like having that chance to communicate it. Um, I don't know if that's a that's just kind of a drifting answer, but it's a good question for sure, Paul. Thanks, Norm. Um, Peter, uh, you heard that Norm mentioned your name there. Do you want to come in on this? And then I'll go to Anna because I see she's got her hand up. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the, the local community in which the potential lithium mine would be. And as far as I know, no one's reached out to them yet. I, I haven't seen it. I haven't heard of it. So I think that that's, a, that's an avenue for us to leap from that place to larger and larger systems. That's my comment. Fantastic, thank you very much, Peter. Anna, over to yourself. Ah, thank you. Oh, Peter, thank you so much. You literally uh, took off my tongue uh, what I wanted to say. I was just about having a lot spoke to, to the communities uh, and to can we actually develop a mine together? in whatever shape or form, ideally uh, brownfield, not the greenfield, to mine less. Because as we can see, and more and more uh, end consumers coming to, to mine and to build their integrated value chain. So, and I think it's great in terms of the efficiency, productivity, all of those words, but in terms of their impact and local community benefits, I'm not sure. Because uh, what I meant by the slide, when I brought together the slide, if you remember about Tesla impact report, the reality check, Tesla depleted the aquifer in the, in the United States. And now it's alarming that they're going to do the same in, in uh, Germany. And where's the communities? Communities probably are not even aware of that. I mean, Germany especially, uh, but the uh, US as well. And we all know that US is one of the worst countries in the world, almost in the same ranking as the developing countries in terms of the water quality. So uh, that's, the, that's the grand problem coming to this simple project. This is what Peter said. I can we talk to communities. Can we just develop? We have enough resources between ourselves here to unite efforts and to co-develop them. Awesome. Thank you very much for that, Anna. Great. Um, I think with all of this, um, there are so many ideas coalescing here and everything, which is really, really fantastic. And especially because I think a lot of the ideas are coming from slightly different directions. And it's almost like it feels kind of like we're there um, on like a, a pool table or something. We've got all these ideas coming together and you've got these balls that are crashing into one another. Are they going to settle in something that makes sense or are they all just going to go spreading out again? So we're like, oh, OK, well, we've all just agreed that it's a really complex system and we can't work out what to do and um, what's actually going on with it. Um, so let's just round off today's session by doing a lap around the room and saying, OK, was that if there's one salient point or one message that you would like everybody to walk away with from this afternoon session, bearing in mind, we've got another three sessions to go. And so we need to actually hammer out, OK, right, where's the action? Where's the impact? And to take the words out of Ludovine's mouth, where's the revolution? Because I know that's where you're wanting to go with this, Ludovine. Um, let's, let's just do a little lap around our, our virtual table that we have here. And I'm going to start with the lovely Ludovine. Um, and then I'm going to go to the fantastic Rowan. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, uh, Paul, amazing discussion. Thank you so much. And I'm a huge fan of the mineral resource governance in the 21st century report. So thank you for bringing it. Um, I, I'm sorry, again, I'm not going to be very um, poetic about this, but you know, we've spoken about mining companies, we've spoken about the regulators, we've spoken about the supply chain, all the way down to consumers and communities. At some point, there is, you know, there's one common aspect to every single one of those. We are in every single one of us. You, every one of us votes for a regulator or a policy shaper, buys as a consumer, invests savings. You know, we, we are the financial community. So um, what I'm taking away from all of this is the huge responsibility we have to start exercising our choices in that direction. You can't say mining companies need to do this. Okay, so make it happen, vote for this, accept the cost. You know, if that means that, yeah, you stop building cruise ships, then okay, are you willing to take that hit? And if not, which one is it that you're willing to take? So, um, yeah, sorry, not very poetic, but very clearly every single one of us 
has to make these choices now. And it's not going to be somebody else doing it for us. Even though in, you know, I'm in France, we love to think the state does everything on its own. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much, Ludovine. Rowan, how about your thoughts? And then we'll go to Anna. Um, well, from, from my perspective, um, over the last few days and, and the conference we had in London two weeks ago, it's very clear that the geoscience community and political community as well are very aware that we do need and will have to continue extracting raw materials for some considerable time into the future. And we're also in the position whereby we have to extract commodities and raw materials that we've not extracted historically. So mining, the geoscience community, the whole geoscience industry is not going to go away and that will not solve uh, our, our transition to a green economy. However, at the moment, as Paul said, it's pretty much the market that determines how commodities get from the ground into our uh, gadgets and so on and so forth. Uh, and what we need to look at, I think, is, is not just from a geoscientific perspective. We know how to extract these commodities. We, we know how to mine, we have the, the experience. It's more how does that activity reflect economically and, and, and in a sustainable manner? So what I'm basically alluding to is we, we, we politicians and geoscientists need to work together to make the case to society. Because right now we, we're not winning the argument or the debate with, with people or society. And I think it's because we either work in a bubble between ourselves or politicians work in a bubble with us, but it's not inclusive of society as a whole. And what it also comes down to is our economic models. <laughs> when markets determine where mines are built and what commodities we dig up, we very much overlook what is necessary in society now in the green energy transition. I know Ben uh, always mentions it, you know, why do we keep digging up gold when we really need cobalt, lithium, copper to develop batteries and electric vehicles? Why do we do that? Because the market determines it. Profit over people. It's until we start looking at it in a different way, whereby we, we extract these commodities not purely for profit, but for sustainable reasons. And you know, to really, it's almost like I'm calling, calling for a revolution, a green energy revolution, right? But sometimes that may be what it takes to restructure our economic model around commodities, more, more so around commodities, not just, let's just overthrow capitalism. That's like, let's look at commodities and the mining industry and the geosciences in a different light, whereby they shouldn't be for profit, they should be for, to fuel our uh, green energy transition, because without that fundamental change, we're not going to get there. So I think that's what we should take away from, and what, what the public, what we'd like the public to realise is that we're not going to pillage the earth and dig up mines everywhere. And, you know, we are fully aware of what mining has done here historically, and we are fully aware of what we need to do to go forward to mitigate that. And we are trying, and along with government, we need to work with governments to do so. But also we need that fundamental change in how we perceive, how we act, you know, as a society, as communities, why we consume things. And that's what Ludwig alluded to. We need to understand what, what, what our purpose is and what we're going to get from the mining industry and the geosciences. Um, so it's going to be a fundamental change. Maybe we should start doing mining for not for profit, but for people, for the environment and for the future. So it's a fundamental change as well as anything else. And I'll yeah. leave it there because I am Welsh and I could be here till. <laughs> on two time talking so i'll be careful let's get you singing next rowan which will be <laughs> beautiful um so so kind of you know describing the fact that we need that purpose um that, that's really there at the moment and I, I thought that was brilliant what you said and by the way i have stolen the purpose word from ludovine because she sent it to me in a private comment so ludovine i will give you credit for that um anna over to yourself some resounding or what's the takeaway you'd like us to take from this um and then i will go to peter Well, I think it's um, proof of verification of what we've been evolving into the last two years. I think I've started from this point and I will conclude with this point. And I think you've got now, for me, this two, three days and their upcoming days is just a verification that we've got enough, right? We all caught up on the same curve, yield curve, 
curse curve. So we're all talking about the same sentiment here. And to support Paul's uh, idea as well, we all remember the Wells of Nations, Adam Smith, but everyone in the corporate world and in free markets world, which is not free, it's all controlled by several MNCs, which are greater than whole global GDP. Everyone forgot or not forgot, but dismissed their, um, his, what he wrote in his moral sentiments work, right? Where it says the self-seeking rich are often led by invisible hands without knowing it, without intending it to advance the interests of the society. And without um, having the natural positive outcomes, we don't have the society. We simply cannot sustain ourselves here. Hence, we need to come back and look back a bit into back into the history and bring the best out of that, where we used to have the cooperative societies, not in terms of the political socialism I'm talking here, but cooperative banks and something that Templars, Knights Templars have developed as well to balance out allocation of the resources and to balance out the consumption uh, and production by uh, and also to put back into their nature what we uh, more than we take from that it's not necessarily of course we can put nickel back immediately but we're talking here about their real offsets not the nominal ones so we can sustain the path of development and hence uh, unlock the new markets and unlock new opportunities for especially for deprived and marginalized communities and uh, the best probably example in the developed world, um, what could have gone wrong and what's gone wrong by all means, by ignoring a lot of facts and risks is Ukraine. It's a country where I'm coming from. It's a war which has happened in the middle of 21st century in the middle of Europe. And it's number four richest resource country in the world. Guys, this is not a joke. This is where the world is rolling into and it expands and really go in scale. Not I mean from Ukraine, but this is an evident example how this evidence of the systems collapse and the failure. And ideally what we can and take it from here, um, how to ensure sustainability. And I think that's conservation discussion is, is economic discussion. It has to come back. The stewardship has to come back into discussion. And I think that's what we've all been talking here from a different perspective. Geoscience, community, economics, finance, capital, legal. And just putting this all now together, starting the use cases, identifying those use cases all together with you, identifying where we can start it in the easiest possible way. And I really like Ludwig's as well comments. Let's not tell someone what to do. Let's not ask how we should, how that someone has to communicate or someone has to mine or, or develop the businesses. Let's just do it ourselves. I'm at the point where it's like, all right, let's build a mining company. Fine. After two years. So, and I would love to have this uh, joint effort to, to develop that. So why someone can, why we can't. So exploring their, the best possible uh, fit for that, fit for purpose, where we can showcase it as a pilot, why not? And um, I think we can take it from there. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Anna. And um, and thank you also for being bringing the situation in the Ukraine um, into the room as well, because it's such an important issue. And as you're saying right now, this is it. We're in 2022 and look what is happening. Gone are the days when we can be surprised by what's going on in the world right now. Um, and by the way, I absolutely love the picture that is behind you on the wall. It's genius. So thank you very much. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, Peter, do you do you have um, any comments you would like to, to bring into the room? And then I'll go to Norm. Um, thank you. Um, and thank you for the day. It's been a wonderful day. Um, I've been just um, ruminating about systems thinking and realizing that we have all of these constituencies. This is our little project in Maine. And the US Department of Energy have has asked how to um, incentivize local production of critical minerals. So our, our communication project could address that. So I want to ask them for money that would allow us at each systems level to ask questions, to, to find out what each of those levels wants to know 
and then provide those answers so that they can all participate in this dialogue, in this question of what would be a just transition and how can Maine participate in that. But I think that we don't know what the questions are. So we can't, for each constituency, so we can't answer them clearly. So they can't yet participate in the dialogue. That's what I want to get some money to do. Awesome. Thank you very much for that, Peter. And good luck with all of that. Brilliant. Fantastic. Norm, how about yourself? And then we'll come to Paul. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Peter, for uh, identifying that we need to look for some money. It's true. <laughs> look, um, I appreciate this very much as well. I'm, I'm going to try to not do what Rowan wanted to do, too, which is talk all afternoon about it. But uh, I will say this. I, I think, and for those of us in the world who have consumer choice, and billions don't, right? billions have limited choice of what they can buy and how, and how they survive in the, with their families for, well, Anna's mentioned Ukraine, that's a new case. But how about Afri the, all the countries in Africa where Coca-Cola is cheaper than water? What is that? What kind of a world do we live in where that's the case? That's always blown me away when I've heard that. Now, I haven't looked at it lately, but I bet it still is. Uh, we have consumer choice though, right? So many of us have the choice to make the right purchase. And I remember so well in Canada and the US where I lived for the first three quarters of my life, uh, the fair trade program where I could buy a product that I knew was certified helping the people who made it. Uh, and I, I'm not sure how well that program has been certified or proven, but I felt good about it as a consumer and I would pay more. Uh, here in Santiago, I go to small shops and pay more, absolutely. I don't go to the big chains. I have the choice. But where do I have that choice in, say, copper or in buying a, a car? I'm not going to buy a new car, probably, but <laughs> my electronics. If I could buy something electronic that said, this product is, contains a certification, right? And, and I know that that's better, and I know that it's sustainable mining that supported it. And I know there's some efforts out there to try to get there. I understand that. I would make the choice. And then we need to communicate to people how that choice will work. Now, some of us are faced with, with uh, products that will go up in price no matter what. Uh, here in Chile, our water will probably cost in Santiago four times what it does today in 10 years. I'm certain of it because we will have to desalinate. So people will be faced with that. They'll have no choice. But what about today? Do we have a choice? Like, is there some way we could maybe offset that impact later by making a better choice today? Same with our electricity. And, um, again, I don't know how to end my comment except to say I believe consumers have all kinds of power in this. And I guess the shareholders do, too, in those companies that they support. But certainly as consumers, where we buy everything, every single day, if we could make choices that we knew were truly more sustainable, uh, many of us would do it. I certainly would. And I would be happy to promote it with anyone that I, that I work with and know. And thanks a lot for the session. <laughs> Thank you very much, Norm. Brilliant. Paul, have it yourself, and then we'll finish off with Matt. Yeah, well, thank you. Lots of uh, interesting thoughts there. Um, I mean, I guess I, I, my jumping off point will be some of the comments of Rowan um, uh, when he started talking a bit about the economy. I think the thing that we mustn't forget is that the economy is the way it is because we made it like that. It is the natural result of the incentive structures which uh, governments largely have created and uh, of our preferences and choices that we make. And unfortunately, most people are not like Norman. Uh, they don't um, buy the good thing. They buy the cheap thing. Um, and that is a well-established fact. I founded an organization called New Consumer in 1990 uh, precisely to promote the kind of consumption that Norman's talking about. And we've seen a bit of that. But everything I've learned since then is that that's between maximum 5 and 10% of the market. And um, the other 90% is what's screwing us up. Uh, but it doesn't have to be like that. We can change incentive structures. We can change what it is that um, uh, companies will do. They've obviously got to make money because otherwise they go out of business. But there's a whole heap of ways of changing incentive structures so that they do other things. There's a wonderful comment from um, someone called Graham McKenzie in the uh, uh, in the question and answer, he's asked me a very complicated question, which I can't begin to answer now. But basically, it's to do with trust. Basically, his question is, why should people do something if they don't trust the other party to do what they say they're going to do? And clearly, we have got 
in a reformed economic system to have much more trust than we currently have that when people say they're doing things in a certain way they are and there are the monitoring and verification systems to make sure that they are and the governments have in place the incentive and penalty structures that will ensure that the economy works the way that we want it to work and of course um Ludovine's absolutely right we're all shareholders we're all consumers we're all uh, voters in those countries where we're lucky enough to have votes and we therefore have a certain amount of influence in order to change the economic system and the way that it operates um, but we shouldn't be surprised about the way it operates it operates because we've designed it like that that's why it does what it does and um yeah i'm all for trying to change that brilliant bring it on paul fantastic and finally matt over to yourself <laughs> okay yeah trying to follow up with everyone um yeah so i really echo some of what anna said and you've really inspired me to be yeah if i actually believe about something maybe we'll just go out and do it stop hanging around and exactly what everyone else on this kind of call said we all got the skills so maybe we just need to get on with it and it's that kind of idea of the tragedy of the commons you know that we've got this you know shared use of a resource our planet and these kind of materials but we all act in our own self-interest until something pushes in isn't in the other way and i have another analogy it's like me standing at people queuing up in covid to get all of their toilet roll and me going that's not a good thing to do you know there'll be lots more of it so don't worry and it's just it's just not how the world works so let's get out there and do something about it and the big thing for me is innovation the way we've done it is clearly not working um you know we need new people thinking of new ideas pushing for that change and innovation is is one of the the best ways to kind of make that happen so yeah that's great thanks everyone for participating really rewarding thanks fantastic thank you very very much matt so everybody um thank you so much for today's session um we've gone from dinosaurs to donuts to dignity into full-blown revolution and setting up our own company which i think is going to be called something which involves those various words which is absolutely brilliant um looking forward to it everybody you know we can have our, our first session you know kind of friday afternoon something like that after we get to the end of the conference we can work out how this company is actually going to work does that sound good for everyone bring, bring your spades bring your spades. yeah exactly we we'll call it bring your shovel i don't know something like that um so fantastic thank you so so much to everybody i think ludovine's cat is indicating that it might be time to stop to stop this session now just as a reminder um we are starting again tomorrow morning for session hang on a second one two three four five six so session six tomorrow morning of eight um uh, starting off at eight o'clock in the morning and we're actually going to start off by hearing from the development partnership institute um so wendy and allison they've been running all kinds of events at the indaba conference in south africa over the last three days all around and they've been basically been running pitch battles for innovations with regards to sustainability in mining okay so they're gonna come to us and say hey this is what happens um so matt to your question or to your suggestion there about innovation let's hear what everyone's been talking about in south africa so that is going to start off tomorrow morning um at probably about 20 minutes past eight is when we get going to get going with wendy and allison and then after them we've got a whole fantastic lineup of absolutely brilliant speakers for you so um everybody we look forward to seeing you at eight o'clock tomorrow morning if that's the wrong time zone for you because you might be in the americas or something like that then we'll see you at three o'clock uk time tomorrow afternoon um, where again we've got a phenomenal lineup that includes people who know the inner workings of those ESG ratings organisations. We've got the chief scientific advisor to one of the main departments for the UK government. We've got people who work for those mining companies, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to be truly glorious. So thank you very much, everybody. A massive round of applause to our speakers from this session here today. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you so, so much for that. Um, one of these days, we're actually going to have to clap properly one another, aren't we? Rather than the silent clapping at the microphone. But thank you so so, so much um bring on the revolution bring on the revolution there we go we can edit that bit out thank you so much everybody see you tomorrow thank you <laughs>